you are a smiley guy. Thank you. <laughs> I've noticed that I was looking for pictures to, of you to put up on the uh, on the YouTube, and I said, "Look at that! He's always he's always got a big smile on his face." Instead of one of those, keep it at the bottom of this cup as it happens. Yeah. What does it say? <laughs> I keep my smile at the bottom of this cup. Oh, this is a. A student got it for me. It's a pro polio vaccine uh, mug. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, got polio, me neither. Thanks, science. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. We All right, let me introduce you. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin Newman, virologist who uh, oversees the Texas A&M University Global Health Research Complex, which identified a variant of the COVID virus. It was very important. He's also served on the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses and has been doing important research into COVID and other viruses. Dr. Newman is the guy that we go to in our morning show on KLIF. Amy Shadroff and I have talked with you probably 10 or 12 times in the last couple of years. Um, you know, there's always something that comes up and you've always been gracious enough to give, give us a little bit of your time and, and uh, you know, bring us up to date in terms of the COVID news that we, uh, we kind of get secondhand, but you kind of make more of it for us. Just like COVID, right? <laughs> Best way. Always yeah. changing, always changing. Yeah, I want to get to that, but of course. But uh, let let me uh, let me start by asking you about a little, a uh, little bit of understanding for a little bit of background and understanding for those of us who are not uh, microbiologists. A little one hundred and one. What is a what is a virus? Oh man! <laughs> and how does how does it differ from bacteria? Yeah, you, you've hit on my final exam question. So right now I'm procrastinating, <laughs> so I don't have to grade my midterm exam. <laughs> that is one of the questions they are going to get. <laughs> and it's nice because there isn't an answer and there are hundreds of answers. And uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, for, for me, a virus is a thing that can move around between cells. So it's like a little like a little spaceman. It needs this little bubble of all the right stuff. Like you can put a human out in the hard vacuum of space and they don't last very long, yeah. I would imagine. Virus is the same way. It doesn't do well except with all this stuff around it, which it finds in the cell. What's and stuff? so they travel back and forth. And they're really just a little code that encodes enough stuff to copy that code ball it up in a little box and send it out to the next cell and uh yeah run the whole party again every couple of hours okay i'm under i'm having under uh, trouble understanding what we're talking about and i suppose it's because it's so, something that uh, i'm not familiar with and that is you're talking about stuff and a code um, i take take by that to uh, understand that it's not exactly life itself it's not a living organism or cell oh man yeah People fight about this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, the question comes down to like, what is alive? And I don't know, what does life mean for you? Yeah. I, I feel like I know what my life is to some extent, but when you try and generalize, I think it's hard to make any definition of life that's sort of based on um, like energy where you don't end up with the sun as a living thing. And I, I feel like the sun is probably not. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's hard to make one where like a crystal of salt that just grows in a salty solution isn't alive. If it's just like a center of order, then people go on the other side. And I think they maybe go too far and they say, no, no, to be alive, you have to have a cell membrane. You have to have these various proteins, yeah. these various bits of DNA. Otherwise, you're out of the club. And viruses are the gray area. They are little bits of the same stuff you find in cells. They move between cells. They're not really related to cells, but they steal stuff from cells all the time. Yeah, they're just weird little guys that are out there uh, causing mayhem. So th they're not composed of any matter? Oh, a little bit, yeah. The, um, the smallest viruses will have one or two genes. Um, so, and, and the genes are kind of like the genes in our DNA. Um, and they just encode little virus parts that will then copy the instructions for that. It's like a super simplified version of the way our cells work. Um, and the biggest difference, I guess, is that viruses always cheat and they never do any of their homework. I'm saying all this from a kind of an educator perspective. 
Yeah, it's great. <laughs> they, they don't like to like, um, oh, uh, some of these Aesop's fables where you got the grasshopper who's fiddling away while the ants are stacking up goods. Yeah. The ants are like our cells. They're like us. We, we put, you know, eat this food. We store all this energy. We're like, we're going to be ready for the winter. Everything's going to be great. Virus walks in like the grasshopper, eats everything, <laughs> goes out, does it again. Yeah. <laughs> That's just Doesn't worry out. about the future or its own existence. No, nah, no. Nah. They go extinct all the time. They mutate all the time. And the only reason they're still around is that they are just good enough at their job that, uh, yeah, they're really hard to get rid of. Uh, I guess I keep, I keep trying to trying to get a better handle on what they are. It's like uh, bacteria, I suppose, or... Uh, living cells and organisms they they are they're yeah, germs right they find their food they store their food they you know do all the things if bacteria want to make dna they're going to start with like okay let's get some carbon and let's okay let's attach this carbon let's make a nucleotide like an a c g or t like awesome we got a couple of those let's get some other things and stick these together build all this elaborate machinery a virus will come in It'll have like one component, like the last component in the assembly line, which is just like, I'm going to take all of that and I'm going to put it together and make a new copy of me. It's it's like a house guest that comes over to your house and destroys all your furniture and shapes it into statues of themselves <laughs> and then, you know, blows the door off and leaves. Yeah, <laughs> just really awful. Well, the worst. So yeah. so where do they come from? Where, where do they come from? How do they develop? How are they made? Or, or... Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows. Um, okay. Or rather, there are six major types of things that we classify as viruses. So th that's what this virus taxonomy thing that you were saying in the intro is. Yeah. It's, you get to give names to things and you get to decide where they fit, and how they connect to each other. And so the six big groups do not appear to connect to each other. We call them all viruses or virus-like, but there's not a single gene that they have in common. There's basically nothing that they have in common, except that they're sometimes in cells and they steal a bunch of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the word viruses is like a penitentiary. We just put all the bad things in there. <laughs> all right. Well, that brings me to my next question. I was going to ask you is, uh, are viruses always bad? Do they, do they have any redeemable quality or purpose in life? Yeah. You know, yeah, maybe, Probably not very much, but maybe. So there are a couple good examples. One is that there's a paper from a couple of years ago and they had this fungus and they're like, oh, this fungus is kind of bad for plants. They found it on plants, but then they found a virus in the fungus. And when the virus is on the fungus, then the virus slows down the fungus. The fungus isn't quite as bad for plants and but together the two of them cause the plant to wilt a little bit it's just like not a very good plant but when they're wilted they actually survive drought a little bit better so the virus wasn't you know it had no altruistic uh, bones in its body it uh, <laughs> was just infecting the fungus the only thing it can do the fungus is infecting the plant the only thing it can do but the outcome is kind of beneficial yeah i don't um, know you know it's, it reminds me of my feeling about I think everybody's feelings about uh, mosquitoes. Why Why do we have mosquitoes? Why do we need mosquitoes? Like why did God give us mosquitoes? You could say, well, they, you know, fish eat them. Well, fish eat a lot of things. They don't need to eat things that are going to suck my blood. You know, That's so right. Yeah. Slap them. We can do without like viruses, mosquitoes. it sounds like. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, viruses vastly outnumber everything else. There's 10 viruses for every cell on the planet. And that's including like bacteria you're breathing in a few hundred viruses with every breath. Every time you drink a little bit of water, there are some viruses that come through that. Mostly they don't make you sick because the viruses are for everything. Every kind of bacteria, algae, plant has viruses. And so, yeah, we're, we're just swimming in the sea of them. And uh, they, they do a lot that we don't really notice because they're so tiny, but they are up in our business everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, that's like, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, good. So good example is um, a couple of years ago, we found a, a sequence just like looking on the uh, computer and it was like, okay, let's look for sequences that look like this part of a virus. Sure enough, pulled one out, gigantic thing. Like, okay, this is probably a sequence of a virus. Neat. 
it was in these sea slugs. They're called a plesia. They, uh, they get about as big as a bread roll. You can sit them on your hands. They're substantial <laughs> ocean slugs. Turns out that every one of these things that's been raised in captivity has this virus. Uh, it's just incredibly prevalent. And these are the ones, they have gigantic nerve cells. And the nerve cells are so big that you can actually sort of clamp them and watch an impulse travel from one end to the other. So these cells are kind of how we understand how our nerve cells work. And the thing is, the virus is all up in these nerve cells all the time. They're completely infected. So basically our understanding <laughs> of nerve cells is based on virus-infected nerve cells. Isn't that weird? It really is. It, it, it uh, you know, it, it makes me wonder. It's like, well, is this like an essential part of life? Is it is it part of uh, of the evolution of life? I, you know, do you have any yeah. deep thoughts like that? This, uh, yeah, I think I think so. Whether we like it or not, I mean. So we've got viruses like HIV, and they're, you know, you find them like in actual HIV patients. What this virus does is it grabs one of your chromosomes, like your DNA, and it breaks it in half and it glues itself into the little gap that it made. And from that point, it becomes part of the cell. And there's literally no way to get it out. Once you're infected wow. with HIV, that is forever. All you do is treat it. Uh, yeah. And occasionally, this happens in cells that go on to make a baby. And so the baby comes preloaded with this little virus, which is really weird. Mm. And so we see this happening, but it's also happened lots of times in the past. And we can tell because you get the same sorts of viruses embedded in caveman DNA, like Neanderthal DNA and some of the other different kinds of caveman. Really? They have these things, and they're in the same position they're in in our DNA. Now, the position is totally random. So this is kind of how we know that you know some of that DNA got into our gene pool at some point. We we can read it out by the viruses. And these things are all over your DNA. They're um about six percent of your DNA is direct copies of HIV-like viruses. About one and a half percent is actual genes that you use. So we're far more virus than person, unfortunately. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I need to stop asking you to try to define a virus because um, it's it seems to be uh, it seems to be a little um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like you you know it's you can't can't grab on grab onto the uh, the essence of what a virus is or why we have them. Yeah, you can define any one of them, but it's really hard to make a collective because there is a virus out there that breaks every single <laughs> thing you'd like to say. Like, oh, viruses always do this. Like we used to say, oh, viruses always grow in cells. And then some goofball goes and squeezes out the guts of a cell into a tube and puts a virus in that. And sure enough, the virus is happy in there. It grows. <laughs> and that's not really alive. And so if you can replicate in a pile of cell guts that aren't alive anymore, I don't know. Does that make you alive? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Certainly a mystery. All right. Let's, well, then let's talk specifically about coronavirus. Sure. Uh, yeah. That's, I guess that's, uh, that's certainly been uh, taking the bulk of your time recently. It's uh, my favorite virus group. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is it really? Well, explain, yeah, explain, yeah. explain coronavirus to us. <laughs> I, I can explain why I like them. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, so uh, coronaviruses are big. Like when you're like little kids often are drawn to large animals like elephants, apparently. And I feel like it was the same for me. I uh, sort of started out dinosaurs for sure. Yeah. But yeah. the big ones, not the little chicken. Right. Ones. Right. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So coronavirus is big. Huh? It's big, big with a little asterisk at the end. It's big for what we call an RNA virus. So inside of our cells, we have DNA in the nucleus and we make RNA copies. And oh my gosh, we go and take those and make proteins. That's I know the, what I remember from high school biology, that yeah, RNA is ribonucleic acid. That's the one. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I remember the word. It's the post-it note of life. Yeah, you keep the, you know, the big volumes. That's the DNA. That lives in the library. That's like the nucleus. You're not allowed to take those out, but you can make a little copy of it. <laughs> and that copy is going to last about five minutes. And that's what RNA is. It's this totally temporary medium 
And all it is is a copy of a chunk of DNA that you can take out and do something with, and then it's going to self-destruct. Yeah, like a little James Bond message. So, so it's the stupidest well, thing to make a virus out of. <laughs> well, this very fragile material that is just not used that way. But coronaviruses never have DNA. They only live as RNA, which is the weirdest thing. Well, it almost sounds like it shouldn't even be possible. Based shouldn't, upon your but they do really well. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I can imagine yeah. in your class, I can imagine sitting in your class, you've got a whole bunch of young people with this look on their face. <laughs> yeah. Just not why? that you're doing a bad job of explaining it. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's just so difficult to, uh, as we, as we say, far too often wrap our minds around it. All right. But uh, coronavirus, how many, you know, how, how many different varieties or I'm not even sure how to ask the questions now, you yeah. know, there are, are there coronaviruses that don't bother us? Are there coronaviruses that, you know, that do, and we've got SARS and we've got, maybe you can just kind of identify some of them. Sure. So over the last couple of years, people have been finding lots and lots of coronaviruses and we find them in things like fish and frogs. We find them in all kinds of, you know, land animals. Um, there are lots of different kinds of birds. Um, pretty much every land creature seems to have a coronavirus, at least one. Now, we know of several in humans, and some are definitely worse than others. But I think the ones that are worst are the ones that have most recently jumped from other species. And the ones that aren't quite as bad are the ones that only seem to be found in humans and look as though it's probably been thousands of years since they were really, you know, coming from another species. Usually, I think with viruses, when, when they cause problems, it's mostly because they're in an unfamiliar environment and it's not just that the virus has to adapt, it's that the host has to adapt right. as well. And of course, we don't adapt. It just kills off the ones it can and the other ones survive. So we call that adaptation for the yeah. species. Yeah. Well, On an individual level, it's no fun at all. That, that's a question I wanted to I wanted to get to and then we can come back, uh, come back to various types of coronaviruses and such. But um, w when a virus makes us sick, is it the virus itself or is it our immune response to it? Almost always the immune response. Yeah. But usually what the virus is doing, you know, the virus is at the bottom of this, yeah, for sure, every time. Um, what a lot of viruses will do, and coronaviruses are awesome at this, is they are very good at hide and seek. Um, they have ways to shut down a lot of the ordinary alarm systems that are built right into our cells. We, we have lots of ways to detect when we're infected, when there's a virus there, when something is haywire, and we're not even sure what. And like coronaviruses will take one of these uh, pathways and they cut, you know, <laughs> the first wire, the middle wires, the last wire, and then they have extra parts that'll kind of blow up any um, additional signals that the cell is able to get out, uh, you know, sort of like alarm signals. They are very, very thorough. And so what that does is that your immune system doesn't really have any general controlling cell. It's just a bunch of little cells doing their best, trying to deal with this problem. And the only way they can talk to each other is by following signals. So one cell will put out a little sort of danger signal. Other cells will send out a come over here and check this out kind of signal. And they'll try and call in the right um, mix of cells. Problem is, if the virus is hiding, they'll get signals like, whoa, cells are blowing up, you know, <laughs> bad things are happening, things that should be on the inside or on the outside, but they can't find the source of the problem. And so the sort of smart cells that would be in there tracking down the exact infected cell and blowing it up, they don't really get a chance. And you have all the kind of dumb, but really enthusiastic cells in the immune system, and they're good at blowing stuff up. And the problem is when they just start doing that in like the bloodstream or in the entire lung, you feel terrible because <laughs> they're taking out a lot of cells. And um, yeah, it's it's well, it's an own goal since this is World Cup time. <laughs> it, it's your immune system hurting you. <laughs> I know I know from talking with you so as we have uh, so much over the last couple of years 
uh, you actually you actually uh, contracted COVID. Oh well, yeah, for sure. It, yeah. it must have been uh, must have been much more frightening for you knowing all of this stuff that's actually going on inside of you than the rest of us. Just like, oh man, I feel crappy. I'm going to go to bed. <sighs> I was worried. Yeah, it was not pleasant. Um, I had read accounts and talked to people who had had it sort of before there were vaccines. And you sort of read the accounts from, um, there, there's a journal called Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is Lovely. the best or worst I'm, title. I'm going yeah. to have to subscribe. Go ahead. For sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it has uh, all the things you would expect in a title of that name. Um, and yeah, the, the stories that you get in journals like that are really bad. But then you learn about like, okay, this is what happens if the immune system is completely unprepared. And so as soon as there was a vaccine, I, I was, you know, like really hoping like, boy, I, as soon as it's my turn, I want to get that vaccine. Yeah, Cause yeah, yeah. yeah Cause that just, it sort of deflects, it blunts the uh, impact. It doesn't stop it completely or it sure didn't uh, in my case, but I got to think it helped. Yeah. I remember when we first became aware of COVID-19 and it was early in 2019. Was it 2019 or 2020? Yeah, uh, early 2019. Well, early 2020. Was yeah, early yeah, out. 2020, yeah. because it actually, we figured, developed in the like latter November part of the 19. previous year. Yeah, yeah. And there's still a lot of conversation about how and where it started. And it came out of a Chinese lab. It escaped <laughs> from a lab in China and and or it had something to do with bats or some sort of food step. I mean, do you have any any feelings? And maybe you can explain some of this to us. I got strong feelings. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Let it let it loose. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you look at this like a scientist, you say, okay, um, so we've got a new coronavirus. The first thing you do is you pull up its genome as soon as that's available, because that's that's what they released. They released the announcement. Before that, it was like a few people are sick and whatever. They could have the flu. They could have a bunch of different viruses. You can't tell what virus you're dealing with based on how you feel, because basically anything that gets into the lungs is going to cause lung disease, you know, mm -hmm. pneumonia, whatever, all that bad stuff. And so, yeah, a cold is the flu is all of these viruses is Ebola, <laughs> yeah. at least at the beginning. Yeah. Um, but you'd say, okay, so look at the genome. What's it like? Which is the same thing we do on, uh, I don't know, uh, 23andMe or Ancestry.com. You know, you get your genes taken. You're like, okay, who are my weird relatives out there that are, you know, DNA matches? And um, it ties into this cluster. And every single other um, member of that cluster, like all of its near relatives are in bats. And so you say, oh, okay, yeah, this is probably at least originally a bat virus. But then the second level, if you're, if you're not new to coronaviruses, you'd say, well, all right, I remember what happened with SARS-CoV original uh, recipe, the SARS-1 mm -hmm. back in uh, 03, well, the end of 02, 03, 04. <clears throat> and that one went through other animals. So they think it went through uh, from a bat to a Himalayan palm civet. And in that, it made like one little change. And with that one little random change, it was then able to get into people and then it started causing horrendous disease. Yeah, much higher death rate than SARS-CoV-2. And so we say, well, all right, well, was it straight from the bat or did it go through something else? Um, I think the weakest point behind the lab leak theory, because I, I don't, I don't really think there's anything behind that at all, other than, other than feeling bad. Like there's this bad thing in the world, and it feels nice to be able to point a finger and say that's that's the person, that's the reason why all this bad stuff happened. Well, there's all that political <sighs> intrigue and yeah, and all the yeah. the theories of you know. Anyway, go ahead. It felt like the explanation preceded the evidence by yeah, quite yeah. a long time. Okay. <laughs> I'll say right. that much. Yeah. <laughs> but so even if you imagine like, okay, it somehow gets out of this lab, which is the lab is the safest place to be because you got all these different safeguards in there, uh, keeping you and the virus very separate. Okay. Um, but where did it come from before that? Because it had to have been from a bat. And if it's also in bats, 
then there's bats out in the world. There may be bats in your attic. There's bats all over the place. And so there's probably a lot more of this because there's, there's a whole bunch of bats out there, <laughs> like yeah, millions sure. and millions, and they're all over the place. And so if this is a thing that can jump to people, it's a thing that's going to keep jumping to people, basically. That, that's that's the worry. And um, yeah, kind of the way I look at it. So let's let's talk a little bit about the vaccines. How yeah, sure. how, yeah. how do you how do you cr create uh, you know how's a vaccine developed when you've got uh, when you've got this mysterious thing that we can't even describe as a substance and uh, <laughs> or figure out where exactly it came from or how it's going to change because that's another thing that we have to talk about is uh, it's about the variants yeah. and how it turns into. A different different shape so you know how do you, how do you go about uh, attacking something like that and trying to develop a vaccine and that was done very very quickly which is another yeah. which is another big uh, big point of conspiracy theories right oh for sure <laughs> yeah. but, but but it really wasn't done that quickly because it had the process of creating the vaccine had been done had been started long before the actual covid arrival is that right exactly yeah yeah and when we got to that point, there was really only one thing that you could do. And I think all the people that had, you know, the big companies had the same thought in about 15 minutes. And it just took, you know, about a year to actually bring that all the way through uh, to fruition. Yeah. Now, I, I think I've undersold the tangibility of these viruses. They they do actually exist. Um, so something like a coronavirus. Um if you were to crack open the little the little shell, the um, the little pink and gray spiky ball that's mm -hmm. in the, everybody's least favorite CDC uh, animation, yeah, you find that that's got the membrane from a cell. So it's like like the plasma membrane, only it stole it from the Golgi apparatus because that's the kind of virus that this is. It's going to steal your insides <laughs> rather than your outside. Yeah. The little things that stick out, those are your spike proteins. And so that's something that the virus has um, coded for itself. It brought in a gene for this, handed the gene off to the cell and said, make me a bunch of these. And the cell just makes whatever is put in front of it. And so it just made a bunch of copies and boom, they all come together. If you look inside, there are a couple other virus proteins, like things the virus has encoded and you know told the cell to make. Um, and then there is the gene and the gene it's just one great big long piece of RNA. It's about 30,000 bases, which is really long for RNA. Um, and uh, But really short compared to like DNA in our genomes. Um, and that's really the virus. It's that gene. Because you can take away the membrane part and you can take away the protein parts. And if you just put that gene into a cell, and you do it enough times, it's really inefficient, but that will actually boot up and it'll become the rest of the virus. It'll make all the other parts. And that's not true of any of the other bits. So the way you go about doing this, and I, I did not make this vaccine, but uh, I, yeah, it's, it's basic stuff. Um, you say, well, which part of the virus can the immune system see? because there's only one protein that really sticks out of that little spiky ball. And so that's what we call the spike protein. And um, so as it happens, nearly all of your immune response is gonna be directed against that. This is how you're gonna find which cells are infected. This is how you're gonna respond to it. This is how you're gonna block that virus from getting in. And so they're just like, well, let's make some of this thing. Let's show it to the uh, immune system. It's like, it's like if you wanted to train a dog or something like that, mm -hmm. I don't know, and you wore a mask of whatever, you know, put your Elon Musk, Musk, <laughs> Musk mask on or something <laughs> like that. And then you kick the dog and then you put the mask on again, kick the dog. <laughs> Eventually you're hoping that he will learn to recognize that whenever he sees that face, yeah, just go for it. That's, that's what training your immune system basically is. You show yeah. it the bad things, like a wanted poster in the post office of olden days. Yeah. And yeah, eventually the immune system learns or it doesn't. It's like uh, teaching. You can present the material <laughs> equally to everybody, but not every immune system is quite as quick a learner. <laughs> so how how does the virus uh, morph and, and change into all oh, these yeah. variants that we hear about? It has to uh, in order to live, yeah. So the virus has a built-in error rate. 
And the cool thing is that people have figured out how to modify these error rates for viruses like this. So you can turn them up or you can turn them down. And the thing is, you do either one of those and the virus becomes, well, if you turn the mutation rate up, the virus makes too many mutations and it dies. And so we actually have a couple of drugs that work against the virus by artificially turning up the error rate to the point where the virus dies, which is kind of cool. Yeah. But if you turn down the error rate and then you put that virus in competition with the same virus, but with a normal error rate, the one with the higher error rate actually wins. And it's because the virus doesn't need to do just one thing. The virus actually has to do a lot of different things, but it has a very small set of genes. It, it only brings a couple of things with it. So I, I, I like the um, uh, metaphor of like, uh, like an adjustable wrench or adjustable tools. The, the virus adjusts itself with mutations, and that's just baked into the way it works. And Whereas something like humans, if we want a different version of a gene, we'll make a copy of the gene, we'll mutate that gene over you know millions of years, and then we'll have two copies, one that does this, one that does that. It's like having the five-eighths uh, wrench and the six-eighths wrench. <laughs> yeah. yeah, virus just brings one wrench in there and mutates it a little bigger, a little smaller, a little faster, a little slower. Yeah, and it works. It's inefficient, but it's good enough for viruses. Now. Today, as we're just as we're talking right now, this is November twenty second, twenty twenty two, and it was in our news this morning. Uh, Amy and I were talking about that the National Institutes of Health has announced that it has uh, begun to create longer, or at least it, it has figured out how to go about creating a longer lasting vaccine than the ones we've had so far. At least that was my understanding of the story. Presumably, you know more about it than I do. Interesting. So I've heard about a lot of things, but I wasn't I wasn't paying attention to the news this morning, so I'm not sure which one that is. The stuff that they have been talking about is vaccinating against two proteins from the virus, not just the spike. And the other thing that they are doing and have been talking about is vaccinating against multiple versions of the spikes. So you'll take like different mutated versions of the spike that the virus has made. Mm -hmm. And you just vaccinate against all of those. So it's like putting up a whole bunch of wanted posters, you know, where he's wearing a hat in this one and a fake mustache in the next one, you know, so you get a good look at the perp. Yeah. So I can't remember. There was some specificity in, in the description of how they were doing this, how it was a, a slightly different approach. But I, you know, I'm not going to be able to remember it. So it's neither here nor there. But uh, it does seem like, and I and I think I've said this to you on the on the radio. It's like, uh, seems like y'all are playing a a never ending game of whack a mole. I mean, if you you keep you you know you keep trying to stop it, and it keeps changing, it pops up over here, it pops over there, and it's like if we if we after all this time haven't been able to uh, cure the common cold virus, what the heck hope do we have with COVID? Well, you got to ask yourself, have we really tried to cure the common cold? Well, I don't know. Have we? <laughs> we don't vaccinate against it. We don't really treat it. No, we just complain about it <laughs> once or twice a year. <laughs> I would think that there would be money in it. Yeah, but it doesn't do enough to knock you out of work for more than a day, usually. And uh, yeah, often doesn't kill people. And the other problem is that there are something like 40 viruses that can cause what we would call the common cold. Yeah. And each one of those would require a totally different set of solutions. Plus, so you need what a we, separate what we, vaccine. What we yeah, have yeah. developed is a lot of symptom approaches, symptom uh, sure. medications, <laughs> right? And they're presumably those are uh, those are making a lot more money than a simple uh, means of wiping it out would. Right, right. Well, and the problem with the some of the anti-flu medications is that. Well, and the anti-COVID ones, actually, to be fair, <laughs> is that they work, but only in the first couple of days of infection. And usually they'll have their biggest effect if you take them before you're actually sick. And that's not how anybody works <laughs> ever. <you laughs> no. know? There's no doctor that would prescribe you these things before you're sick. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just like they tell us, well, you're actually more contagious before you start to have symptoms. Okay. Well, right. that's not very helpful, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Let me get my time machine. Yeah, sort that out. 
uh, there was something else. Oh, I know. Um, what now in the in our in our brief history with with COVID, we've seen uh, we've seen all these changes come about the variants, and essentially they have uh, you know kind of the same symptoms. One variant will have less of one type of symptom and more of another, and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's mostly hooey, but yeah. Really? Why? Why is that? It's all small sample size stuff. It's like me saying, well, when I had it, yeah, we yeah. didn't have much in my nose, which is true. And I felt really dizzy. And uh, so that was BA5. And so saying that, well, everybody, this is what BA5 does. And if you say that, there'll be somebody out there who may have had it and they'll say, well, yeah, I felt dizzy too. And then it sort of reinforces. I see. It's just, it's confirmation bias. It's <laughs> yeah. when people actually try to, do these experiments they're, they're really hard you need millions of people because it's it's not just the virus that causes the disease it's the interaction between the virus and your genetics and your immune system and nobody has a really great map of what their immune system is doing right now we would have to like dissolve a person and you know <laughs> then we could kind of figure it out nobody wants to do that <laughs> for some what? reason <laughs> <laughs> what I was getting at was, it seems, <coughs> excuse me, it seems like, uh, and I don't know, maybe we're just getting used to the whole business, that uh, with each new variant, we're getting uh, like, well, you know, the symptoms aren't as, aren't, aren't so bad, but, uh, right. and, or, or, and, or, but it's more contagious, you know, there, there are differences what are the what are the odds at this point? Are they is the is the virus getting to become less of a problem for people, or are we our immune systems starting to really dig in and develop, or is there a chance yet that we could have a big whopper of a COVID virus that comes along that isn't affected by the vaccines, is very contagious and is very deadly? You know, could that happen? All those things are possible. I'm I I don't think. It's most likely, but these are these are million dollar questions, and I don't think anybody has like a real hand on heart answer that they could totally, you know, with a hundred percent confidence give you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so the reason, the biggest reason why the new variants seem less dangerous is that everybody by this point has either been vaccinated or infected, whether they know it or not. Mm. Pretty much, yeah. And what we saw was that uh, like when Omicron, which was widely considered to be, oh, it's less dangerous. When it got into Hong Kong, it was horrendous. It killed a ton of people. It was, um, yeah, as virulent or more than the older strains. And it's because those were people that hadn't been vaccinated and hadn't actually uh, ever caught it. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're, the, the playing field has shifted a little bit. And I don't know, I, it would be nice I think probably what everybody needs is for this virus to kind of fade into the background and go away. Yeah. Because that would be a lot nicer. I mean, yeah, just, right. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of just living. The problem is the things that we're doing, we're kind of trying to force it to that point by saying, you know, plug in our fingers and our ears and saying la 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 I can't hear you yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm sure there's no virus I'm going to live my life and doing that is the thing that is going to drive the virus to grow more and yeah the more the more skepticism there is over the vaccine I, I think we're still um, a little under 10 percent um, actually boosted with the Omicron specific booster right now and anybody that doesn't have that is just an open door yeah, <laughs> for yeah. the virus to come in, basically. Well, recently yeah. we've yeah. we've we've seen uh, we've seen the return of of polio, and uh, maybe yeah, maybe okay, <laughs> maybe you can it's talk definitely about in the sewers, yeah, yeah, which means it's definitely in at least one person, and we don't know whether it's in more. So it could be somewhere between a little bit bad and fairly bad. Um, the thing that happens with polio that is um, when they give the live vaccine, it's really rare, but maybe one in a million cases, that virus will actually uh, start a long-term infection instead of a short-term. 
usually doesn't do anything to the person. They don't even know that they're carrying it, but it'll live down in their intestines. And every time they go to the bathroom, there will be a ton of polio that comes out mm. into the sewers. And so that kind of persistent infection could generate this signal, or it could actually be something like an outbreak. And we're just studying sewage right now, and you can't tell. You can't tell where it came from, which is the beautiful thing and the uh, kind of useless thing about that. I think, I think most of us were under the impression that polio had been done away with years ago, but I guess yeah. that's pretty much only in our society, not not worldwide. Right? Oh, they've been so close. I, I remember like 10 years ago, my parents were in Rotary and they had a bumper sticker on one of the cars that was uh, buy polio and thanks Rotary. <laughs> and that was right around the time that Syria fell apart and Afghanistan fell apart. And basically, wherever you get war, the other three horsemen are <laughs> not far behind, you know, yeah. including pestilence. And so you get diseases spreading because nobody can get to a war zone. And there are new little people being born all the time everywhere. And they come in with zero vaccines until you can get there and vaccinate them. So it's tough. Yeah, uh, polio is on the ropes, but it is not quite knocked out. And it would be hopefully in both our lifetimes. Yeah, we're going to see this. I can remember as a kid standing in line and getting my shot at the school cafeteria. And then eventually they got to a point where they were giving us a sugar cube that was much more Mm -hmm. preferable. (laughs) Um, I I had a babysitter uh, growing up who had had polio as a kid down in Arkansas. Yeah, one of the later cases. And uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I I knew knew a number of people that had polio, you know, in the 50s and Mm -hmm. 60s. I go back that far. But uh, so so is it your opinion that uh, we've kind of we've kind of given up our de- our de- our defense efforts uh, way too soon? I told you uh, on the air the other day when we were talking that I took my wife into a medical center just a yeah. couple of weeks ago now for for a carpal tunnel procedure, and there was a sign on the door that said everybody must must wear a mask. And we go, oh darn, I for- we forgot our masks. And she said, well they'll have some inside, and I say, yeah yeah you're right. And they did have some sitting there on the counter, but there wasn't a single person anywhere in that medical facility wearing a mask. Nobody who worked there, none of the doctors, none of the nurses, none of the others. It just blew my mind. I'm not particularly concerned about it. I've had every single vaccine and booster that that is available. I tend to pull into CVS when I drive by and go, hey, maybe I can get another one. But (laughs) I'm, I'm just wondering, should you know, making sure that everybody... Because there are a lot of people that still don't believe that there's any value. And in some cases, a lot of people that think, oh, this is the government's going to, you know, somehow nefarious intentions are going to run my life. So, you know, I don't even know what they think. But how are we ever going seen, to? Uh, huh? Have you seen any public service that runs with that level of precision and detail? <laughs> Yeah, right, that's a good point. People that have trouble keeping your internet on and yeah, electricity yeah. sometimes, those are so, the ones that are secretly tracking. I mean, <laughs> so that's a whole other level of complexity and expense, yeah. I think. <laughs> should we should we still be masking up? I think we're getting toward the season where uh SARS-CoV-2 is going to spike again when there's going to be a COVID spike. They're starting to see some in California, and I think everybody's kind of braced for it. Um, But then you look at somewhere like the UK, and they had four distinct waves of COVID (laughs) over the last year, just up, down, up, down, each one about as high as the other, sort of fill the hospitals, empty them out. And that's pretty rough. Yeah. Um, And this was after we all started exchanging, you know, visits again, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. Canada wouldn't let us come to Niagara Falls for two years, and they finally did. But it's like people, (laughs) people are going to England while England is getting a new wave of COVID. Right. And I I don't know that the U.S. is more of a danger to England than England is to the U.S. They both have quite a lot of uh, COVID. Um, The countries where we see that uh, there really isn't as much are places that have a lot stricter control. So like China, they're in the midst of um, one of their spikes right now. And uh, this spike is... It, they're only getting about half as many cases per day as the U.S. has right now, 
for the U.S., this is like a period of you know one of the lowest COVID periods we've yeah. seen in years, and we're so we're all really it. happy about it. Like, yeah, it's over. And for them, this is like a horrendous uh, spike. The other thing you notice, though, is that places like China, like Singapore, where they're extra masky and uh, like that, they usually get the same variants that we get, but they get them two or three months later. So they're not the source of these things. They're actually, uh, yeah, <laughs> the the sink. The, the, the viruses are coming from other places uh, and working their way in. And the reason why it's slow is because they're doing a good job of slowing the virus down, slowing down virus spread and entry. And that's that's terrible. Yeah. But um, the world's connected and you can't unconnect it. And yeah. Now this is an extra part of that connection that uh, you have a reasonable chance of spreading the virus at the same time. I was talking with uh, with my partner Amy at KLIF, and yeah. we were discussing the fact that number one, she uh, her husband got COVID, and uh, had a quite had a pretty good, pretty heavy case of it apparently, and he was off work for I don't know seven or ten days or something, and uh, feeling pretty bad. She lived with him through that entire period. She's never gotten it. Um, I've never gotten it. My wife has never gotten it's it. Okay. And she works with, <laughs> with a lot of people in the public. You know, Are there some people that just are flat out immune by, by human nature or what? For other viruses, that does happen. Yeah. For COVID, we don't know yet. Um, but like uh, if it was Ebola, yeah, you can uh, read out certain bits of somebody's DNA and get a pretty good picture of whether they're going to live or die. Now, they'll all get sick, <laughs> but oh, uh, some of them will be able to control the infection better. And if your body is controlling the infection in the right way, you won't necessarily notice. Mm. So I would say you may have been exposed. I've almost certainly been exposed at some point. Uh, uh -huh. um, and it sounds like your body just dealt with it. And so, yeah, that's that's one for the vaccine. That's pretty well, good. Yeah. Well, now here's, here's, a, here's a case. Now, this is another uh, question about my own personal experience. And this happened yeah. This happened right after, uh, right after the whole COVID thing started to get in the news, but before we had the vaccine, the first vaccine developed. So I hadn't had any vaccine. One evening at home, I felt feverish and I took my temperature and I had a fever. I never have a fever. Never, ever, ever. I don't remember having one since I was a child. You know, mm -hmm. and I went to bed and I think I did stay home the next day because just because I had had fever that night, I felt okay the next morning. And that was it. It totally went away and never returned. I never had any other symptoms. Is it possible that that was just my whole case? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, you'll never know, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> The little at-home tests, um, you need about 10,000 times as much virus to set those off. So they're real good at getting peak cases, you know. On I just was going right to ask day. you about that. Yeah, not great at any other time, like on the way up or the way down. <laughs> so if you're really concerned or maybe you've been exposed or maybe you're going going on a trip or something, uh, you you would want to get a, a serious test where, like at a doctor's office, at a, at a pharmacy or... or yeah, those yeah. Like they, they call it a PCR test. And yeah, yeah those 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 work. Um, they're, or rather, they're the best thing that we've got. They're still not perfect because you only put a tiny amount into the tube. And so it's a question of whether you happen to have a couple of virus copies in like a five microliter sample, which is, you know, so tiny, you can't even pinch your fingers together small enough to uh, <laughs> fit that. Um, I guess you could start to do it. You could do that same test. You could take like a liter of mucus from a person. That would be very annoying to collect. Um, yeah, you could boil that up in like a witch's cauldron, run the same <laughs> test. It would probably oh, cost dear. you a half a million dollars, but you would get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and it'd be a good one. Yeah. A liter of mucus. That may be a good place to end here. I don't know. <laughs> Is there something that we need to talk about in terms of uh, the, the the future of COVID? Uh, do you have any any sense of where we're going? Is it just going to be with us forever? And and you know, like like the cold, like the flu, continue to shift and change every year or whatever. 
And that's just going to be one of those things we live with. Well, those of us who do live with it. So there have been there's there's really only been one big shift. And that was from old COVID to Omicron COVID. Everything that's come since is basically just dancing around that Omicron shape. There's not more than one or two mutations. What we're seeing in some of the newer versions is that some of the mutations that were there, that were sort of escaping from antibodies and stuff, have gone away. They've actually gone back because every time the virus changes, it has to pay a price as well. It's like you can't just change some part of your car and expect the car to still work. You, know, you can't replace most things under the hood with a banana and expect to have, you know, an <laughs> operational motor vehicle. That that's like what mutations are for the virus. Um, so it can make these changes and they make it a little weird, but uh, it seems as though they are not being selected. So really, it's been two problems. And the cool thing is that the old version of COVID has completely died out. Through vaccination and immunity, we have driven that thing to extinction, which is really cool. Wow. Had no Problem idea. is, yeah, we're not there for Omicron. And uh, like I was saying, we're, we're about 10% vaccinated in the US and uh, less in other parts of the world against Omicron. And that most people have only had one Omicron booster. And probably we need to get like two of those in us, you know, to <laughs> really knock this out. So it's solvable, at least for now. The, the virus only changed once. And as long as we can change once over the course of maybe three years, we can probably keep up. That's not as fast as I think people are worried it might be. Yeah. Very interesting. And certainly it's a subject that's going to be with us for a long time. What, what else are you working on? Anything specifically that's kind of, you know, get your mind out oh, of yeah. COVID once in a while? <laughs> well, we find new viruses. Those are always fun. You just sort of pull out a virus look and sequence from some plant or animal and then chase it up and make little parts of it and see if they work. That very interesting. Um, um, the other things I like are, uh, well, yeah, my family and stuff, I guess. But <laughs> if we're talking yeah. work things, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, fossils are uh, the other uh, really good thing. Um, uh, I've got a couple people helping me. There are a lot of these little tiny fossil seashells from around 300 million years ago. And most of them have never been properly described or named. It's just like all these things that are, I don't know, part of the story of the earth and Texas and how we all got here. And they're just sitting there and nobody likes them. It just seems like little little coins or treasures laying all over the ground. And you can just go pick them up and tell people about it. And okay, I think that's the cool me, thing about science. Make sure people understand you do. You live in Texas as I do. And, that's right. Uh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just north of Dallas. And I was puttering around in the backyard one time a year or two ago, and I found a little tiny, I found a, a fossil shell. And and I, I went, oh my gosh, look at this. And I took a picture of it and put it on Facebook, of course. That's the first thing you do, right? And For sure. Yeah. And people were like, wow, that's really cool. I said, and I started thinking about it. I said, you know, this may have come from a land landscaper who hauled in a bunch of rock or something. <laughs> but... Uh, I had no idea. You so uh, does is archaeology a, a you know a, a a career aspiration or interest, or is it just kind of like a, a, a the, what what it's a scientist a, would have as a hobby? It's a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. There really isn't a part of this job that isn't uh, uh, kind of interesting and fun. And I just think that's I don't know. It, it's something I've liked uh, since I was a little kid. Yeah, I, I wanted to I wanted to run a museum for a while at like yeah. seven years old. Yeah, and you know, find the Tutankhamun's treasures. There was that phase, and yeah. Uh, this yeah, this is just a way to do something like that. But it's also at least somewhat useful, I think, uh, to the world. There is if you know the fossil, you know when you're looking, and you know um, yeah, what was happening to the Earth around that time. It's just yeah. kind of cool. There is a uh, there's a series on Netflix right now. I think it's a fairly short series, but it's called the Ancient Apocal Apocalypse. No way, yeah. And I can't remember this man's name. He just and he was also on uh, Joe Rogan's show just recently, and I was listening to him, and he's very interesting. He's a journalist, not uh, not an archaeologist, 
but he says that uh, archaeologists are set in their ways. They refuse to open their minds to the possibility that there was some great cataclysmic event 12,800 years ago and that there were ancient civilization, advanced civilizations that were wiped out by that event and they're finding, and he's, and this, this whole series takes us into various jungles and shows us things. And it's really, really interesting. You, you look like you recognize what I'm talking about. I used to have those books. Yeah. Uh, Graham Hancock. Yes. I, I secretly Googled it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. window, like, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you got yeah, Netflix, and- check it out. He's got a series there. But then there's this idea that like the Egyptians, they're aligning the pyramids right. you know, for space and they have rocket technology. And, and all the, the problem- numerology, the, the, the numbers that goes into the, the precise well, measurements of the base of the pyramid and the height of the pyramids and all that stuff. Yeah, but then this is a time when they hadn't quite figured out plumbing yet. <laughs> Yeah. And they ate so much sand that it wore down their teeth. And it's like, wow, but you were making rockets. You know? Good for you, I, I guess. Yeah. I don't know what you were making them out of because they only had bronze. But, you I, know. I, I, I had that kind of thought, too. And I'm listening to this. And I'm going, yeah, well, why? Why did they? Why did they? Why didn't they invent the wheel? You know, sure. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, rockets first, wheel second. That's fine. Why not? Hey, ben, yeah, this I, better... I yeah missing no. parts like old history um like before written history it gets real fuzzy and they yeah. they keep finding things over in turkey that are like fairly advanced civilizations it's like what is this <laughs> how does this fit into anything i don't know yeah <laughs> kind of neat yeah, but it is fascinating it is mind expanding well for sure again ben thank you so much this has really been fun i've really enjoyed this and hey, anytime uh, yeah. I, I, I think you, you've, you've explained a lot and I'll, um, uh, I'll stop there. Sometimes I don't know how to say thank you and just stop. Thank you. Thank you for listening and asking nice questions. How's that? <laughs>